ladies and gentlemen, today proof that my followers are some of the coolest and nicest people you could possibly imagine. This is a Jaguar XKRS GT, easily one of the most special, hardcore and rarest cars Jaguar have ever produced. The XJ220, Project 7 and Project 8 are all far more common than this, which was made in numbers of only between 40 and 50 worldwide. To even see one is an extremely rare thing. In my entire life, I've only spotted one before, and to be able to drive one is an extraordinarily rare opportunity. But more than that, not only is this an already super rare car, it is just one of two in the entire world in Italian racing red, and it currently has just 660 miles on the clock. And I have been told that I should enjoy it as Jaguar intended. I am a very, very lucky boy indeed. XKRS GT was the swan song for the X150 generation Jaguar XK, one of my personal favourites and a car that one day I am determined to own, though unfortunately it's unlikely to be one of these. At the time of its production, the F-Type was essentially already here, with the F-Type Coupe only around the corner. The XKR was already a fairly old platform and everybody knew it, but Jaguar saw that there was still some life in the old girl yet, and so they created this. In terms of engine, it is exactly the same as the existing XKRS, already a fairly hardcore and special thing. So, 542 bhp and 502 pound-foot of torque, that's just shy of 700 newton meters. That is ample grunt for the vast majority of people, and so for this, Jaguar decided rather than try and give it any more, instead, they'd focus their attention on making sure this car could use every single drop that it already had. To that end, the car has a dramatically revised suspension. In fact, much of it is closer to that in the later F-Type than in the existing XKRS. In terms of the front suspension, only a few components were actually unchanged. The front track was widened by some 2 inches, or 52 millimeters, so it could accommodate even wider rubber. 255 section. Spring rates were up massively, near 70% at the front and just over 20% at the back. The active limited slip differential was also recalibrated because with that sharper, tauter front end, it could now be a little bit more aggressive in the way it locked up and provided traction at the rear. I'm sure you also haven't failed to notice the rather dramatic body kit, which comprises the same one you'd find on the XKRS, plus some very aggressive canards and a big wing at the back, which between them do make real genuine downforce. Making sure it stopped as well as it went, you also had, for the first time in Jaguar history, standard fit carbon ceramics front and rear. Today's headline sponsor is Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that recently has had a little bit of a makeover. They've got a new look and a new style for their reports, making them even easier to read than ever before. So, don't forget, if you're on the hunt for a used car, make sure to use a Car Vertical search, because in just 60 seconds, with only a registration or VIN number, you'll be able to get all the information you want to know on any potential purchase, including accident damage, regardless of whether a car was written off or not, potential mileage discrepancies, outstanding finance, and for common models, they'll even give you some handy hints and tips and things to look out for when going to buy. Car Vertical is available on both desktop and with their new mobile app. For 10% off the service, make sure to use my link in the description down below, and don't forget my code, which is JM. Allegedly, the original plan was to produce just a handful of these 10 to 20 cars exclusively for the North American market. 
But as soon as their customers closer to home heard of what Jaguar were planning, they demanded a slice of the action. And so UK customers got them too. That is provided you are willing to stump up the £135,000 they were asking, which to give you some context was not just a huge uplift by about 35 to 40 grand over the XKRS, it was also more than a GT3 RS of the time. Though for the most part the specification of both European and American cars was essentially identical, there was one key difference, which is that cars bound for the European customers got this interior, complete with bucket seats and cage in the back taking the place of the rears. And I have to say, for me, the seats really are a big part of the experience. They give the XKRS GT that genuine track racer vibe that you get from something like a 911 GT3. But for all its lashings of carbon fibre, Alcantara, bucket seats and big wing, at its core this is still an XK. It is still, despite its weight saving, a 1.7 tonne GT car. You still have the original infotainment, there is still a Bowers and Wilkins stereo in here. And for that I am actually kind of glad, because had they been those things the car would have been even less usable, but actually likely not really any better for it. But when it comes to creating a car like this out of something such as the XK, you do run a real risk. The fact was, it was never going to be as light as a GT3. It was never going to be quite as quick as a GT3 when it came to the all unimportant Nürburgring time. And the issue then becomes, in chasing this goal that you were never to achieve, you just ruin an already brilliant car. Is that the case for the XK RS GT? Well, Time for me to shut up and the car to show me what it's got. absolutely love it. I think of all the cars I've been fortunate enough to experience, this has to be the one that most drives the way it looks. Which is to say it's 50-50 Gentleman's Express and Track Day Escapee. It's absolutely beguiling this thing. At low speeds, even with dynamic mode off, you do notice that the car is pretty firm, much more so than just about any other Jaguar I think I've driven, including the likes of the Project 7 and the Project 8. My sources tell me that the real difference in terms of suspension between regular and dynamic mode is that in regular it does retain an element of being active, so it'll soften itself when it feels appropriate, but in dynamic it's just firm all the time. However, that being said, pile on the speed, which is very, very easy to do, as it is in every XKR, and it does take on an element of suppleness, it does start to breathe and work with the road, like a sort of roid-raged Alpine A110. Never has quite the subtlety of that car, but it does become a little bit more lithe than you might expect. It also turns in like no other XKR I've ever experienced. I'm actually going to take it out of dynamic mode for a little bit, which will quieten the exhaust down a touch as well, as I'm sure the locals will appreciate. However, the car is no duller really for it. The gearbox I have in manual and sport mode, and though that really is the Achilles heel of the package on paper, you know what, in reality, it's still pretty darn good. Upshifts are executed fairly swiftly, and the downshifts are accompanied with a nice little blip, and in dynamic mode, a bit of crackle as well. <laughs> and in all fairness, like the standard car, if you are in the wrong gear, the engine has so much grunt, doesn't really matter 
all that much anyway. Of course, so much of this is exactly like the regular XKR experience, the view out, which is sensational, particularly with those little vents in the bonnet. So instead, I'm gonna focus on the stuff that's not the same as your common or garden variety XK. <laughs> the steering. It is definitely the best the XK ever got. Still doesn't have quite the feel and the interaction of the F-Type, but it's pretty darn close. It's still light at all times, but I think a Jaguar should be. It does, however, still possess feel. You get into a bend, the car starts to wait up, and the wheel communicates that to you nicely and clearly. As a petrol head, getting opportunities like the one I've had today is incredible. It's like being an art van and the Louvre phoning you up and saying, hey, we like your art. Do you want to just borrow the Mona Lisa for a couple of weeks? You can hang it next to your copy of Dogs With Cards. And that's how I feel driving stuff like this. And it's all possible thanks to people like Mike and like you, because so many have chosen to subscribe. The word has gotten out that this is a channel that people like, and it's one worth trusting with stuff like this. And so if you've enjoyed today's video or any of the other content that I've made over the last seven years, but haven't yet subscribed, now is your moment to do so. It'll take you a second, hit the bell icon as well and costs absolutely nothing, but it is a life-changing event for myself and any other YouTuber out there that you're following. Please do it, it makes a big difference. Though it is an essentially irreplaceable car with next to no miles on it, I'm confident to put my foot down. The traction control will still intervene, dynamic mode reins it in just a touch, and though it will light up the rear with a little bit of provocation, it's not daunting, it's not scary. Once the limit of traction is reached, what happens is you just find the nose wandering a touch offline, and then you back the power off, and the car just proceeds as normal. It doesn't cut in unreasonably early or anything of the sort. It's actually a very, very sophisticated and very civilized car to drive quickly and that makes it so very enjoyable. And mercifully, this car does also have a fresh set of PS4S's on it. I daren't think what it would have been like on the original tyres that it still had when Mike bought it. He, it will likely not surprise you to hear, is a bit of a Jaguar fan, a lifelong one, on account of the fact that when he was younger and dating his now wife, her father was a Jaguar mechanic, and so he'd get whisked home after an evening visiting the girlfriend in a lovely Jag, a Mark II 3.8. Today, he is lucky enough to call this one of several Jaguars that he owns, and the others include a Project 7, a Project 8, a very, very late XJ, the XJ50, and to top it off, an XJS2. That's a very, very cool lineup. This particular car belonged to Jaguar themselves, part of the collection at Classic Works, and it was purchased as part of the James Hull fleet, which included a great many interesting and unusual Jags, including a purple E type that once belonged to my father. That's a cool connection. And speaking of cool connections, I have already mentioned that this is one of just two in Italian racing red. The vast majority of them were in white. However, there is, as far as I know, just one in black. And it belongs to a lovely chap called Dylan, who lives in Japan. And a few years ago, he invited me to go and drive it. In fact, he was so keen for me to come and experience the car that he even bought me a plane ticket in early 2020. And for that, I am eternally grateful. And as soon as the conditions permit, I will be heading over to Japan. I will be showing you that car because it's also really cool and very special, though mechanically essentially the same as this. And he has a few other things too, but I'm sure he's watching. And Dylan, I didn't want you to think that I had forgotten you because the opposite is true. In all fairness, I thought that I would have to go all the way to Japan to experience an XKRS GT because they are so incredibly rare. And this one, having the few miles that it does, I am absolutely ecstatic that it has worked its way into the hands of a gentleman who's actually going to use it. 
as we all would like to see it. Every single one of the cars in his fleet is used, enjoyed, taken on big trips to the continent, and that I think is absolutely brilliant, despite its pretty extreme looks, though I wouldn't really chance it in the odd multi-storey car park. This is still a very usable car, particularly on European tarmac. It'll be perfectly smooth. It's still nice and quiet, comfortable in here. You have your infotainment, you have your Bowers and Wilkins stereo, though it does, as you can probably see, have say belt four-point harnesses in. It also has the regular three-point belts. So uh, if you're just hopping in it, going down to the shops, you don't have to faff with clicking yourself in. The boot is still exactly the same size as in a regular XK, so more than ample for getting plenty of luggage in. And um, it is a real proper jag. An angry Jag, for sure, and one that on a road like this doesn't cope anywhere near as well as, say, a regular XKR. But where I would say criticise an F-Type for being overly firm, the simple fact is, when you buy something called the XKRS GT that looks like this, you do expect it. I'm also told that it is actually half decent on track provided it's dry. There are still some things that Jaguar were never ever going to change. <laughs> that engine is mega. As you might have guessed, given the rarity, these have held their money pretty well. In fact, to pick one up today, you are essentially going to have to pay the same as when it was new, so around £135,000. That's a lot if you compare it with, say, the regular XKRS, which I think for the majority of people is all the car you would ever need. And as a GT, is probably superior to this. But this is not your average, ordinary, everyday Jag. It is something really quite special. The missing link, essentially, between the XK and the F-Type. And in all honesty, though 135 grand is a lot of anyone's money, there are a lot of other things out there I can think of that are far less interesting and far more common than this that still cost quite a bit more. And if you don't mind, I've got to hand it back in a few minutes, but between now and then, I think I'd like to enjoy myself. After all, I'd hate to let Mike down. I want to say a massive thank you to him and, as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>